Well, thank you very much, Patrick, for agreeing to do this interview. It's very nice to talk about such a, a successful car. The, the Megane Scenic was uh, a, a really a start of a revolution, really. But first of all, before we had the, the Renault Scenic, we had a concept which is also called the Scenic in 1991. Um, what did you want to achieve with this concept? Yes, well, um, the scenic, uh, the scenic concept car, uh, otherwise uh, known as uh, Z01, which was in the first series of the concept cars that we launched after I arrived in uh, in Renault. Um, originally, I wanted that car to come out as the very first concept car, but in fact, we changed the order and came out first with the uh, Laguna Roadster, because uh, some of us felt that um, having a sort of a fiery hot type of car was also very important it's in terms of communication, communicating to the public that, you know, that uh, we, we, we did have uh, uh, gasoline in our blood. But um, I really felt much stronger, really, ab about the, uh, the, the scenic concept car as um, it was very much uh, part of the, um, the mission that I had been given by the then president of, uh, of Renault, whose name was Raymond Lévy, who hired me, which was really to launch once again uh, a saga of um, vehicles that uh, uh, demonstrated a certain intelligence, demonstrated a um, you know, fascinating interiors with, with lots of ideas. Um, and, and, and so we felt that um, uh, launching a mini espace or, you know, uh, have, taking into account the, the, the great success that we had had with the, uh, the espace, uh, I was absolutely convinced that this would be me uh, making, you know, a big splash. And so, I, in fact, I wrote a, a letter which, is, uh, which was dated, I, I looked it up, on the 11th of October, uh, 88. So that's really the first year that I arrived in, uh, in Renault, where I made this proposition of both Laguna Roadster and, and the Scenic. And we started working on this car with this um, idea of uh, coming up with a brand new uh, concept. A brand new concept where we were very much family oriented, uh, with the idea of um, offering an interior where uh, even the kids would be happy. Um, you know, I had so many stories of, uh, of children uh, uh, not being too happy being sat in the middle of the car in, the, in their father's, uh, the parents' cars, my wife being one of them. You know, they got into the car about an hour before they left, you know, not to be in the center. So we really try to imagine that uh, that interior where kids would really love getting in whatever the seat and so we we designed it with individual seats with individual uh, tables with the uh, uh, individual area for, for them to place their their toys or their books or, or, or whatever and we also had this idea which i joined in the document uh, uh, making this proposition of having a, a rear belt, you know, the real, uh, with having a dive in it in order to allow children at the back to have a, an excellent view just as the parents had at the front. And so we made this proposition. <clears throat> it took us quite quite a while to to develop it. There was uh, quite a group of people, uh, many that uh, that were involved. And our our idea was really to return to the to the extraordinary that's basically what we called it with a, an interior that was filled with uh, with magic uh, be it also in um, in terms of the color and trim you know which played a, a huge part in uh, in this in the in the strength of the vehicle with the idea of having each seat in a different color and each seat representing a continent and we just anticipated the, the, the lovely little fights among the children, you're know, saying, oh, oh, you were in America last week, it's my turn to be in, a, and you go to Asia and so on. So uh, we, we imagine all this scenario of, of, of these kids uh, 
really enjoying the, the, the journey. So it was very much of an invitation for a journey. And it was, you know, of course, before video games. So uh, children didn't spend half the time underneath a blanket, you know, playing their videos. They actually looked outside, you know. So yeah, that was, that was really a, a kind of a magic vehicle, I must say. Yeah, those were the days when we actually looked outside <laughs> the window. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so we had the, the the scenic concept, and it was it was well received, from my understanding. Yes, it did. It was very very well received. We presented it at the Frankfurt Motor Show, and I recall we had an awful lot of people, very very much interest. What what really uh, surprised me is when you think about it that. Um, contrary to what one might have done later on, is we ourselves were not very reactive because uh, we were very concerned about the, um, the financial, um, uh, financial de development of that vehicle as a, as a, as a one-off, uh, not a one-off, a lo loan uh, vehicle. Um, and, and basically we had to wait until a decision was made to, to launch a range complete range of vehicle whereby the scenic variant could then be placed within it, which of course changed completely the ball game because then the objective that we were given is, was to maximize on the carryover parts between the range. Having said that, originally there was so little faith in the potential of the vehicle inside the company, or let's say there was faith, but they never believed that we would have reached the kind of numbers that we reached eventually. Uh, because, you know, one has to uh, remember that we actually sold 2.8 million vehicles of, this, of the first generation Scenic. And so at the start, it was in fact going to be in, in plastic, you know, the same body, uh, polyester, you know, it was the same body as that of the first three generations of, of, of the Espace. Um, because we just didn't believe that we would be making big volumes. Um, but as the program developed, um, the, the confidence in, in the project grew. Uh, and so uh, at one particular meeting, and I, I, I remember that so well, I remember where it took place, and I remember the words the, the, the president, or the new president, Louis Schweitzer, uh, elected, in fact, that we should go for um, sheet metal, and that you know that clearly changed the ball game in terms of um, uh, in terms of cost, in terms of investment. But then we felt, well, okay, it is going to cost an awful lot of money. But then let's see how much we can uh, how how much money we can save on maximizing the number of uh, components shared between the the sedan and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and we even uh, reduced the potential marketing cost by uh, placing the scenic within a complete range. So when it began, in fact, it, it came out as the Megan scenic and it only changed its name when we arrived, you know, a little bit later on in the program. So that was a, you know, that was a real, a really important moment where that decision was taken to go away from a plastic bodied vehicle to to steel right right and you mentioned it was the megan scenic and going back to the megan of course you have this accent on the ian megan you have the accent on the ian scenic and i know that you were doing a lot of work with the the delta group within uh, yeah. renault to be able to um to to uh, do more lean manufacturing. So maybe you can talk about just, just yes. why, did, why did you think about putting these accents on the E? Well, we clearly wanted to, to stress the, the Frenchness uh, in the vehicle. We clearly could have, have lived without it. But uh, basically, I, I insisted that we should put the, the accent. And it was all to be seen within a background. Uh, namely, when I arrived in Renault, very shortly after I arrived, I was given a major project in the company, which was to reduce time to market. And my second biggest uh, assignment thereafter was to implement the recommendations that had been made 
by the studies that uh, took place at the MIT, um, which led, as far as the, I would say, the general public is concerned, uh, those that would be would have been interested in this uh, remarkable book that was launched at the time and which really was a, 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 an absolute bombshell. And that was the machine that changed the world. And in fact, this title um, was all to do with the, the to Toyota's uh, approach to lean engineering. Now, we, Renault, were one of the companies that um, uh, had invested, had uh, you know, promoted or uh, taken part in, in the study financially. And we, a group was uh, created uh, called the Delta Group, which, which I led, which um, had uh, uh, for, its, for um, its aim to uh, implement the recommendation of, uh, of, the, uh, of the MIT. And within the book, there was a chapter which was written by Welshman uh, uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel Jones, who, who said something like, if I, if I can recall right, he said, one of the strategies offered to the European manufacturers will be to stress the specificity of their, um, of their, of their origins, of their nationality, in order not to offer a regroup target to the Japanese manufacturers. Now, of course, one has to look back on, on, on this period where there was no such thing as uh, competition from uh, China or wherever, but Japan was, um, was just so way ahead in, in their manufacturing uh, practices. And basically, you know, when that book came out, you know, written by James w uh, Womack, Daniel Roos, and um, uh, Daniel Jones, it was a bombshell. It was, you know, the end of the dinosaur period. And those that didn't take uh, to change and making this, you know, the huge change that was needed were, in fact, doomed. They were the ones that uh, just couldn't hope to survive. And so very much with, with regards to this, this little chapter from, uh, from Daniel Jones, and I, I've often, you know, talked to him about, and he used to, I remember he made a conference where I was attending and he said that if, uh, if he had been paid one pound each time that I had quoted him, that he would be a, 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 you know, a rich man, which is probably true. <laughs> <laughs> a very big influence. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, so, so the McGann is a success. You released the McGann and, and that's a successful mm. car. Um, what changes specifically did you do to make the scenic? Well, the scenic had um, an all new body, uh, clearly. Um, uh, what we did do was to uh, ensure that the uh, instrument panel and then all that was assembled behind it uh, was exactly the same uh, as the sedan. It just meant that the actual um, instrument panel was tilted a, a little bit. And then we ensured that we um, really did a, a thorough um, carry across uh, uh, operation uh, and anything that we could do. I mean, it, it went all the way down, you know, the door handles and things like this. E everything that we could do was carried over uh, between in, within the whole range, you know, was carried across. Um, and, and that made a huge a, a huge difference in terms of the the overall uh, the overall investment. So that was you know that was a, a damn good thing. We also, as you uh, noted, of uh, that even in in terms of the design approach, uh, we elected to really place it within the overall range in order to reduce the potential marketing cost of you know, launching a brand new name, hence the fact that we call it the Megan Scenic at first. And then, of course, when, uh, you know, the, the vehicle started selling um, at, at such rate, you know, we at one stage, we were, we were you know, too, close to 2,000 a day, you know, which is uh, an absolute uh, mad as far as we were concerned. We never anticipate that kind of volume. Then, of course, it, it became uh, autonomous, and the idea as to you know the the, uh, the replacement that there was absolutely no doubt that it was going to become the scenic 
and and be separated from the range of uh, of the Megat. Absolutely. So the Scenics of success. I mean, it's selling four times the quantity you, you ever thought it was going to do. Yeah. How did that change Renault's future direction? Suddenly, Renault had gone in the early nineties from being on a everything on a shoestring to suddenly everything was successful. You had lots of money. How did it change how Renault went in the future? Louis Schweitzer, uh, our president, um, said in, in an assembly, but he told me also uh, that um, uh, the sales, the sales success of, of Scenic uh, enable uh, Renault many years later or a few years later, well, not that many years later, in fact, it was 1999, um, to buy a, a huge chunk from, from Nissan. So that's how big uh, was the impact, and uh, and everyone agreed that um, uh, had we not had the success of the scenic, that this was clearly not this would would not have happened. What it did do also was to action the pump. You know, it, it activated the pump, namely of a return to more. In, it sounds a little bit arrogant, but a more more intelligent vehicle. By that I mean. Closer to some of the white stone, what I call the white stones of, of, of Renault, of the post-war, starting you know, with the Renault 4, which was the first car with a, with a, with a hatch door, and the, and the R16, which had uh, uh, this extraordinary uh, modular interior. And then again, one could talk about the, the R5, you know, with its uh, uh, plastic uh, front uh, bumpers, and you know, kind of Bumpers, sorry, not not just not just up front, but the overall uh, plastic bumpers, which began a totally new um, new scene, you know, in the automobile industry. And then I could, you know, probably also, yes, of course, add add the the, the S pass. So, and then there, there followed a a long, long time where the the company be, became extremely discreet, as if it had totally lost confidence, and we're into this period, you know, where we were coming out with cars like uh, the R9, the R11, you know, uh, which were uh, absolutely non-events in terms of uh, uh, being uh, very much um, nondescript, very much uh, vehicles which had gone through the uh, uh, market research to the minutest of detail in order to ensure that you got a vehicle which was designed not to be not to displease, but certainly not to please people, and um, you know this was this was the overall uh, uh, approach that that um, had you know taken over the the, the the company, and so this huge success really pushed, or it gave confidence again in, in Renault, and I, I must say that. Of course, a lot of this, most of this, happened during Louis Schweitzer's time. But on the other hand, it is the very first uh, president who who elected to uh, to go in this direction, knowing that he, as a man, had absolutely no car experience, none whatsoever. He arrived, and um, uh, he he recommended what he felt was you know sort of a, a kind of a gut feel, but based. On analysis, you know, he came from a very famous, uh, uh, very famous uh, French engineering school called Polytechnique, of whom one says the people that they know everything and nothing else. And um, uh, he, he really came up with this fantastic plan. He said, you know, uh, here we are. I give you carte blanche. You can, you can do anything as long as it's in the interest of Renault. That was, you know, what he said. And then from now on, you can you can do what, what you like. And I want you to come back. And if, if I need to get involved, I will get involved. And this is how it led to, to Twingo. And so all these things, you know, were coming along one after the other. And it's all based on this kind of a vision, visionary man. Um, and then we move on to the RX4. So at this time, it's, it's really only, it's only four years later after the original McGann Scenic, but... There was very quickly, I think there was a backlash against MPVs as being a little boring, maybe a little bland, sort of just for families. Um, was the RX4 a take to try and make things a bit more exciting or was what was the, what was the vision behind this tough streetwise look? 
Um, I think you've really nailed it. You know, basically, the um, the midsize uh, vans were looked upon as being purely um, a family man's uh, uh, vehicle, which <clears throat> clearly had nothing to do with the automotive passion. It was um, the, the vehicle that, um, uh, inverted commas, that uh, one was uh, condemned to own if one had a little bit of intelligence and a growing family. So it made it, it was very, uh, very, very much based on, on good sense, you know. But uh, in, in terms of, uh, of image, uh, well, it, it, it was not, I mean, you, you had difficulty in allowing people to think that you were in fact the James Bond in real life, you know, if you drove a scenic. So um, the idea of the RX4, um, which to me is, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very sad that it, it didn't do uh, better. It, it might have arrived a little bit too early. Maybe it, maybe um, you know, I, I was looking and looking at people's appreciation of the RX4 a couple of days ago, dating to those, dating back to those days, and then some felt the car was uh, uh, was rather. Uh, Ugly. Others thought, "Wow, but it really has got a lot of character, and it it looks so masculine, and so on and so forth." Uh, my feeling is that it, it arrived just a little too early on on, on the market, and um, and basically the the volumes were it was okay, it didn't lose money, but they only sold forty thousand uh, vehicles, um, which is okay, but uh, but. We we were expected we we're expecting to do a lot better than that, um, and so it, uh, personally I, I I I like the vehicle. I thought it had a it had a, an awful lot of character, an awful lot of presence, and sure enough, you know it um, it was very distinctive within a showroom, um, right next to a, a, a regular scenic. Um, I was going to say ordinary scenic. No no no, regular scenic. <laughs> um, and so it actually, you know, it 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 uh, it did the job. It did the job, but yes, I, mean, I guess it it must have arrived just a little too early. Um, you know, the the SUV craze came a few years uh, later. Mm. And then we move on to the second generation of Scenic, and it has a whole new design language which you're bringing across to the entire Renault range. So, yes. how did the second generation Scenics? shape fit into that new design language? Well, the, 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 the design language began with, um, and it's a very important vehicle, um, in, very, very important concept, probably the most important, probably the, the, the most important concept that I've, I've done, you know, all, all these years or been involved in. Um, and that was the concept car Versatis, which was this coupe, which was designed for the um, 100 years anniversary of, 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 of Renault. And uh, uh, the, the vehicle was, was designed so that the, the front end expressed modernity with this one box approach. And then the rear was very flamboyant and uh, recalling, in fact, the flamboyance of French carrosserie uh, just pre-war. And... Uh, I personally, you know, I love, I love the, the, the design of this vehicle. And um, we, I, I showed it to our president who, who just absolutely loved it. We showed it in Paris. We had an excellent um, uh, welcome from the general public. We even had a few journalists who liked it. But um, the public just absolutely loved it, as well as the designers. The designers throughout Everywhere in Europe, you know, we had so many people on the stand, and that car to us was the obvious one to uh, to um, uh, to take inspiration. And the very first um, influence that the Velsatis concept car had was on the Aventine, which is another story, of course. But then came um, the 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 Megane two, and it was. Uh, uh, we just happened to have a, an, an excellent uh, team uh, on, on this project with a, a young 
uh, Frenchman, a 23-year-old uh, young, uh, young Frenchman in a, within an excellent team. And um, he, uh, he really fought all the way to defend his project. And then one has to add one small detail, namely that the program director for the Megan II, including Scenic, was a gentleman called um, Carlos Tavares, you know, who is today the, the president of the Stellantis group, who was, um, who, who is uh, um, an absolute uh, car nut. You know, there's absolutely no, no, no question about it. He loves motor cars, he loves racing, he races himself. And um, when we had reached that part of the development, uh, I had conversations uh, with him to say that uh, we, we think that, you know, that Renault as a company is excellent in terms of packaging, of, of delivering brand new package, and they certainly uh, um, you know, are, are very open and, and they, they accept new ideas or uh, themselves create new ideas. But there's one thing which, where they're not so hot, namely is to come up with a decent package when it comes to uh, classic references, namely that of the positioning of the wheels on the body, uh, or all, all that, the basics, which, for example, Audi did so, uh, you know, did so remarkably well. And of course, he understood that, you know, he thought, I mean, he said, okay, I'm going to help you. And so we, we invested a lot of time, we invested a lot of, uh, of effort, we created uh, even a book which called The Fundamentals of Good Design, and so on and so forth, uh, in, in order to make sure that the next generation, and starting with this key vehicle, um, would just look right. You know, when it's on the road, it looks right. It's not one of those, you know, where the, the wheel is so far inside that you bend to have a look, you know, bend down to have a look and say, is anybody there? You know, and then you, you have the echo, anybody there? And so, so the car was just right, you know, sat on its wheels. Uh, the tumble home was perfect and so on. Uh, and, and the fit and finish. So basically, uh, the Megane 2 is, to me, a far better car, far, far better car than the Megane 1. Uh, and far better car than the, you know, the scenic being better than the, the than the, than the first generation as well. So, you know, there is all this background, which we uh, carried across the range. We did carry it across the whole range, but we gave a more autonomous personality to the second generation uh, scenic versus the first generation, which really fitted the mold of the rest. There, you know, we, we, get, we gave it a... Uh, we gave a bit of a freedom. In fact, the car was designed in our design center in Barcelona, which had the marvelous advantage of being away from the maddening crowd. And, um, and so, you know, each time we were able to, to reach a kind of a maturity. And then when we arrived, you know, it, uh, it always cre created a, you know, a, a stir. Um, but fortunately, uh, they, they they liked it, and uh, yeah, the, the the car was uh, was um, just went through the whole uh, approval without any uh, any any problem whatsoever. So yeah, it was it was a damn good project. We enjoyed it. It was a thoroughly enjoying project. Good, good, enjoyable project. Good. So, and then we move on to the third generation scenic, which was looked very similar to the second generation scenic. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. The third generation scenic, um, we enter a, a totally different uh, environment. Uh, we enter the, the environment of the, um, uh, of the uh, arrival of Carlos Ghosn, uh, who then, uh, uh, that at the, at the point in time when, um, uh, when Louis Schweitzer um, goes into retirement, we enter into a period where um, clearly there is uh, a feeling that we should leave what had been our credo, namely that um, 
we had termed this period where we're doing this very uh, um, strong identity vehicle, which I had called them landmark designs. And, uh, you know, we were returning back to mainfold uh, market research, uh, doing uh, cars that um, wouldn't offend, uh, uh, you know, um, little ladies crossing the street. And uh, it, it was clearly, uh, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, you wouldn't get, a, um, you know, your heart thumping, but you wouldn't get a heart attack. And you, you did not dislike it, but you didn't love it. And so we just did this rather nice car. Fortunately, there was a very good um, head of the, 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 the design director on that project. Uh, it was a fellow called Fabio Filippini, who's a damn good designer, who uh, later was in charge of uh, Pininf left Renault and uh, after I left. And he, he went to Pininfarina and he's a very talented man. And overall, uh, the car is, is, is well designed. It's highly professional. It's well assembled, uh, uh, exterior, interior, and so on. Uh, it, it's, I, I feel it's a, it's a good design. But as I said, you know, it's, um, I mean, I, I was personally, as a designer, I was into fiery hot uh, tea, you know. Uh, or ice water. And this is kind of, uh, you know, mixing a couple, fiery hot and, and cold, and then you have, you know, lukewarm. And so we, we entered this phase, which lasted quite a bit of, you know, quite a few years, I feel. Um, yeah, and it was, it was also a period, you know, the change of management uh, and all the... Uh, troubled uh, environment in the <laughs> and uh, lot, lots of management changes that um, did not encourage uh, creativity, let's say. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for this interview. It's uh, wonderful to, to discuss this car, which was such a revolution back in the late 90s and, and started a whole different class of cars really i mean there, yeah. there were other cars similar to it previously there was some mitsubishis of course the fiat 600 multiple back in the the, the, the 50s which tried to do this yes, sort indeed. of thing but renault really caught the imagination of mm. everyone in in europe and also around the world with this car so thank you very much for for sharing yeah. your, your 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 thoughts and your your, your feelings about it okay thank you